Judges chapter 11. And now, um, uh, and, and before we talk about this, I want to I uh, address something that I think is probably a misperception that we have when we approach the Word of God most of the time. Now, last week I talked about how Jephthah grew up in this, in, in a really rough, uh, from a really rough upbringing, right? And he had every reason to be rebellious against God. He had every reason to leave. And yet when the nation of Israel called upon him, he answered the call. He is here listed as one of the many judges. The Bible describes him as a judge for uh, several years. And yet, and yet, he is in very few ways the person you would want to paint as a picture of faith. Now, the reason this is important to talk about uh, is, is because we have this habit of looking at uh, people that God uses and we assume, well, if he used them in this way, then surely every other aspect of their life has got to be commendable. And that's not true. The Bible, in the Bible, God uses people, men and women, who are faithful and who are godly, who experience uh, great moments of spiritual victory and very low moments of spiritual defeat, people who are weak in character and people who are great in character. And even if their name appears in Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter of faith, it does not mean that their life is squeaky clean. Okay? Now, the reason I'm mentioning that is because as we read through what we're going to tackle with Jephthah's story, we're going to find some things that are very disturbing. They're actually very, they will cause you harm when you dwell upon this. Uh, because if you think that uh, the story of Abraham and Isaac is difficult, wait till we get into Jephthah's vow. Hebrews chapter 11 describes a whole bunch of people who behaved based on their faith. And their faith is what is commending, but it is not necessarily their lifestyle. Jephthah is mentioned there. And because he is, there are a lot of people who will compare Hebrews chapter 11 and Judges chapter 11 and say, this does not make sense. In Hebrews chapter 11, it commends many different men and women for their faith. But it commends people that you and I probably don't want to hold up as a perfect picture of of spiritual maturity. It includes Barak, and we know that he was a coward. It includes uh, Gideon, who at multiple times in his ministry fell into idolatry or allowed people to fall into idolatry. It includes, uh, it includes Samson. And my goodness, did that man have problems? And the church said? Amen. Right, okay. And it also includes Jephthah. In this list. And while Jephthah has some moments of great faith, he exercised his faith and he did fantastic things for the people of Israel, much of his life is not something to be commended. Right? In this text, and then the next one we probably won't cover, in this text, he makes an oath before God and he follows through, and it's a low point, a spiritual low point, surely for him, except maybe by the next chapter where he's in the middle of a civil war with Israel. Uh, that, that also seems to be a fairly low point for a judge, spearheading civil war against Ephraim. So let's take a look at Judges chapter 11. Take a look at this text that I'm talking about. And uh, verse 29 is where I want to pick it up. Then, uh, Judges chapter 11, verse 29. Then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed on to Mizpah of Gilead. And from Mizpah of Gilead, he passed on to the Ammonites. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord, and he said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering." So Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand, and he struck them from er Eror to the neighbor of Mineth, uh, 20 cities, and as far as Abel, Karamim, man, I'm getting a workout with the names, with a great blow. So the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel, verse 34. Then Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and behold, remember he made a vow, first thing to come out of my house, first person to come out of my house, first thing to come out of my house, I will offer as a sacrifice to you. And behold, his daughter 
came out to meet him with tambourines and dances because she knew her dad was a war hero. Right? And behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and dances. She was his only child. Besides her, he neither... He had neither son nor daughter, and as soon as he saw her, he tore his clothes, and he said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you have become the cause of great trouble to me, for I have opened my mouth to the Lord. I cannot take back my vow. And he said to, and she said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to the Lord. Do To me, according to what has gone out of your mouth, so that the Lord, uh, now that the Lord has avenged you on your enemies, on the Ammonites. So she said to her father, let this thing be done for me. Uh, Leave me alone two months that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity. I and my companions. Now you'll recall last week we talked a little bit about the role of Jephthah's mom and I said, Um, You know, she was a prostitute, which means back in an ancient day, women typically passed on from the care of their father into the care of their husband. Going into prostitution as a form of earning money was not plan A. It was plan B for their life, right? Okay. So we have the same scenario here where she sees her life unfulfilled. She's never passed over from one to another. The trajectory of her life, she is still a girl. Um, And so she's weeping for her virginity is how this phrase is uh, coming across. She says, leave me alone for two months that I may go up and down on the mountains and weep for my virginity, I and my companions. So uh, So he said, go. Then he sent her away for two months and she departed. She and her companions wept for her virginity on the mountains. And at the end of two months, she returned to her father who did with her according to his vow that he had made. She had never known a man, and it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of of Israel went year by year to lament the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite four days in the year. In other words, four different days throughout the year they would weep on her behalf. The first question I'd like to ask, and we're going to get into some of maybe the more um, maybe the more troubling stuff in just a moment. But did Jeff to bargain with God? Do you see this in the text, right? Just from the very outset. Um, Jephthah to makes an oath. He makes a vow before the Lord. And he says, if you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I greet, uh, when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's. And I will offer it up as a burnt offering. Did, did Jephthah to make a bargain with God? My next question. Is that appropriate? Ah. Uh. Well, of course it is. I can think of one or two or maybe three examples in the Old Testament where somebody else has bargained with God. You remember Abraham. Surely you will not destroy this city if there are only 50 righteous people. For 50, I will not destroy the city. Okay, 45. Okay, for 45, I won't destroy the city. Okay, for 40, I won't destroy the city. All right, all the way down to 20. All right, for 20, I won't destroy. How about 10? Just 10. Okay, for 10 righteous people, I will not destroy the city. And guess what? It went up in smoke. Right? I'm not sure. I mean, I think Abraham was trying to bargain with God, but I'm not sure he's a good example of somebody who bargains with God. I think you can find lots of places in the Bible where people want to bargain with God, where people think they're bargaining with God. The question is, can God be bargained with? Deeply philosophical. We just jumped into the deep, into the pool. But can you bargain with God? And here's why I'm asking this question. Even the most irreligious person you have ever met will try to bargain with God at some point. You know that expression, there are no atheists in foxholes? Right? Right. And here's why. Because if you're in the bottom of a foxhole and you are scared that your life is about to end, there is there is. One prayer that will just come out of your lips, whether it's appropriate or not, it is, oh God, if you get me out of this, 
right? Get me out of this position here, then I will. What will you do? Well, then I will make an honest woman out of the, the girl that I'm living with right now. Then I will stop cursing. Then I will go to church. If God, if you get me out of this, then I will do this. And think of all the different things that we offer to God sometimes when we think that God is ready to come to the table and bargain, right? But can you, can you bargain with God? I want to put that on, on a shelf. I want to come back to that question in just a moment. Uh, because I would argue <laughs> that the way you interpret that will, will determine how you read Jephthah's narrative here. And I want to clear up one, one textual thing. Nobody wants to believe that Jephthah did what it sounds like he did. If you read through commentaries, you will find people dancing to try to come up with a reason why Jephthah did not offer his daughter as a burnt sacrifice before the Lord. Or, or, and that he never wanted to. And maybe, maybe when Jephthah made the oath, he wasn't thinking of a person. Maybe he was thinking of an animal because you know, sometimes they keep animals in their house and, and a pig was going to roll out or a sheep was going to come out. And maybe he wasn't, he wasn't giving a big scale offering to God. He was just giving maybe something smaller. And yet, and we want to say that because we don't want Jephthah to be this person, Right? Um, there are other people who will look at this and say, maybe he made that offer to God, but instead he didn't actually sacrifice her. Maybe like Samuel was given over as a pledge to God, maybe that's what happened with his daughter. He made a pledge to sacrifice her, but instead of sacrificing, he dedicated her instead. And so she was weeping over her virginity because now she was just going to be a virgin perpetually for the Lord, right? But the text doesn't say that. And you take the most conservative the most conservative translations you can find. And the same language that is used, that Jephthah uses to offer whoever comes out of the door, is this, this is the same language that is used in Leviticus for the sacrifices that are offered to God. Okay, so I don't want to whitewash this. I want to say he pledged something to God that was horrible. And I believe he followed through with it. I think that's what the text says. And I'd like to punctuate that um, by, by saying this, this moment is brought to you by the fact that Jephthah was not raised with his people. He was not taught the ways of his God. And he did something here by offering his daughter to God or something of significance to God, believing that it was a way to honor God, which sounds crazy, unless you understand that gods at this time in this place were actually demanding child sacrifice. The Bible makes six different references to Molech, a God who demanded child sacrifice. And in fact, one specific place in in uh, Deuteronomy 12, 31, when God is addressing his people, he says, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. For every abominable thing that the Lord hates, they have done for their gods, for they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. In other words, God explicitly tells us, this is before Jephthah, God explicitly tells his people, yes, other gods are worshiped that way. That will not be so with you. That's an abomination to me. Right? But Jephthah did not grow up with his people. He was not trained by his father. He did not know the statutes of God. Here's another really good example. If you make an oath to God and you find out that it is a rash oath and you cannot obey it, Leviticus chapter 5, verses 4 through 6, give you a way to break the oath. It says, or if anyone utters uh, with his lips a rash oath to do evil or to do good or any sort of rash oath that people swear and it is hidden from him when he comes to know it and he realizes his guilt. This is exactly what happened to Jephthah. He offers this promise to God and then he realizes the great price that he just offered. When he comes to know it, 
and he realizes his guilt in any of these, when he realizes his guilt in any of these and confesses a sin that he has committed, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for the sin that he has committed a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat, for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for him for his sin. In other words, you make an oath to God, and you cannot follow through, make a sacrifice to make atonement for yourself. It's not the position of Jephthah. I have made an oath. Clearly, God expects this from me. Which leads us to another really interesting question. If Jephthah made an oath to God, if you allow me to defeat the Ammonites, I will give this sacrifice to you, right? Did God take him up on it? Because the Ammonites were defeated. Right? Are we working with all the feelings at this point with this text? Okay. Because this all hinges on this one question. Can you even make an oath to God to begin with? Can you bargain with God in a way that he is responsible to deliver to you something if you deliver something to him? Right? Oh God, if you deliver me from this foxhole, I will go to church. Every week, forever. Oh God, if you deliver me from this foxhole, I will marry the woman that I am sleeping with. Right? It doesn't really matter what comes at the end of that bargain. Whatever you offer to God carries no weight to God. Bargaining actually only works if you have have something to offer. You realize that? Any kind of bargaining. Any kind of bargaining only works if you have leverage, if you have something that somebody offers. Think about all the vain bargaining that people have done with God. If you get me out of this, if you save my life, then I'm going to do this. As though God needs the thing that you're offering to him. As though that should ever impact what is happening over here. Here's what I'm telling you. Jephthah had to make no oath at all because the Ammonites were going to be given into his hands because that's exactly what God decided to do. When when Abraham was... Uh, bargaining with God about uh, Sodom. God already knew what was going to be happening to Sodom. There were no bargaining chips that Abraham had. And um, let me... Have you ever played the game Munchkin before? Anyone played? It's kind of a board game. You've got cards. Nobody's ever played the game. All right. Munchkin's really, really fun. But usually, typically when you're playing a game of Munchkin, somewhere in the middle of this really innocent game, uh, it takes a dark turn. Because in the middle, in the middle of the, the game of Munchkin, you know, you, you bargain with people all the time. I've got this card. You've got this card. I want this. I've got this. But it doesn't take long before even my sweet, innocent children realize that there are darker ways to bargain than just a straight bargain, right? Um, like we've learned while we played Munchkin the distinction between, um, the distinction between blackmail and extortion. Yeah. Do you know the difference? If I explain this to you, will you tell somebody later? Yeah, the preacher explained to me what blackmail and extortion was. Okay, Black, blackmail, blackmail is when you say, if you don't do this, uh, if you do that, then I will do this. Oh, you think you're going to do that in that? You think you're going to play that card in that game? If you play that card, I'm going to play this card, right? Here's extortion. It's completely switched. I plan on playing this. No, please don't play that. Well, what are you going to do to stop me? That's extortion. Extortion is, I'm going to do this. You have to do something to stop me. Blackmail is, if you do that, I will do this. Two sides of the same coin. Right up there with bribery. And all of those, all of those are considered unfair ways of bargaining with people because they use leverage against somebody. Right? There is no leverage that you have on God. There's none. It does not exist. Bargaining any kind, bribery, extortion, blackmail, or even just regular bargaining, because it's a nicer thing to do. You cannot bargain with God. Which means... 
Jephthah will uh, be faithful to God's calling because he's faithful, and God will be faithful to his purposes because he will. But he had no need for Jephthah to make that oath or to fulfill that oath to him at all. And the reason he did, I think deep down, is because Jephthah lived his entire life working for everything he earned. Everything. Where he lived, how he got money, it was the fruit of his own labor. And so to be in a relationship with a God where it's not dependent on his hands and what he does was beyond his comprehension. And so God had to be somewhere in the sphere of what Jephthah could control. So he makes an oath. Here's why this is problematic for people of faith. I think we offer oaths to God all the time without thinking about really the consequence. If it's something that God wants, then do it. Be an obedient person. If it's something that he doesn't, then don't. But do not think for a moment that God is yours or mine to control. Since when has he ever been? If he is, hear me, if he is, your view of God is too low. It is. It absolutely is. Romans eleven fifteen. Or who has given a God a gift to him that might be repaid? Acts seventeen twenty five. God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything, for he himself gives to all men life and breath and everything. And if we believe that our relationship with God is some kind of reciprocal one where we scratch his back and he scratches ours, then we've grossly misunderstand, misunderstood our faith and we've grossly misunderstood it. Mi, mi, I can't talk now. Misunderstood it. A sovereign God. This is what it means for God to be God. It encourages us to have a low view of God when we believe that we can bargain with him. And here's the other one. I think it really encourages the wrong kind of prayer life. If we believe that God can be bargained with, what does your prayer life look like? Matthew chapter 6, verse 7. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think, they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you act, ask him. Verse 9. Uh, pray then like this. This is Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your name is holy. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Jesus very simply describes to his apostles what it looks like to pray to God. And a faithful prayer to God does not start with where I am at and ask something from God. It instead starts with God. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. You are a holy God. Please forgive me. And when we adopt a prayer life <clears throat> that includes bargaining with God in any way, we misunderstand our relationship with him. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of reasons. I'm sure I'm going to have a handful of conversations with people afterwards who are convinced. Jeff did not possibly do what I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced he did. And we, we, we can spar on that. There's a lot of exegetical stuff there. But I actually, I really do believe he made a horrible pledge he should have never made. And I believe he followed through it with it because he believed that's what an honorable person would do. Um, but he got into that mess to begin with because he believed he was in a position to move God around on the chessboard. And he's not. This is probably the most fundamental thing that is hard for us to get through our heads as people. Is that the world does not revolve around me. My faith is not mine because I'm a self-made man. I am who I am because of what Jesus did on the cross because of who God is and because of eternal, his eternal grace for me. His ways are higher than my ways. His purposes are greater than my purposes. I am here to lift him up and to praise him and to point people to him. Recognize that in our prayer life looks different than Jeff does. Recognize that in our faith is deeper and broader And it's not self-centered. It's about God. It's not about who I am. It's about who God is. And it's about how I can direct people to him. Um, And so my, my encouragement, I just want to encourage us to consider this tragic story came because Jephthah had himself on the throne in his world instead of God. And as painful and as difficult as it is for us to realize, many of us do that every day. Christ is sovereign. He is on the throne. Let's live a life that communicates that to our friends, to our neighbors, to our brothers and our sisters. I, I don't, you know, this, this, is a really, this is a really down passage to preach about, but it's important because it's formative. It talks about who we are in the world. And if you're here and you're asking that question, who am I? Well, you're never going to know unless you know who you are before God. Um, And so I encourage you to seek God, to seek a relationship with him, to seek a better relationship with him. And if, as you examine your life, you recognize that you've been on the throne for years Ask something very provocative. What would it look like if God were instead?